Hello. In 1753, an alderman of the city of Bristol, William Vick, died leaving a thousand pounds in trust to Bristol Society of Merchant Venturers, specifying that when it had grown by compound interest to ten thousand pounds, it was to be used to build a stone bridge across the Avon Gorge. One thousand pounds in 1753 in today's money is a lot. Okay, if you insist, it's about £285,000, okay? The River Avon connects the old port of Bristol to the Severn Estuary and then onto the sea. So the port is about 8 miles or over 12 kilometres inland. The port of Bristol is one of the Britain's oldest and most important ports. The problem was that anyone wanting to cross the river to the west of the port had to make a long journey because the gap across the gorge was so wide and over 200 feet deep, about 61 meters. Hence, William Vick's bequest. In 1829, the sum had grown to 8,000 pounds and the merchant venturers didn't want to wait any longer. When rich people get impatient, things tend to get done. A committee was formed and they soon realised that such a large stone bridge would cost about ten times that amount. So they set up a competition with proposals for a suspension bridge. Isambard Kingdom Brunel sent in four proposals. He had time on his hands because he was first recovering from his injuries after the second flooding of the Thames Tunnel. Check out the last episode to find out about that if you haven't already seen it. And then the work in the tunnel stopping altogether. It also shows the level of his creativity that he could come up with four separate proposals. The possible spans across the gorge range from 760 feet, about 280 meters, to 1,180 feet, about 386 meters. Bear in mind that Thomas Telford's recently completed suspension bridge across the Menai Strait in Wales had a main spar of less than 600 feet and at the time was the longest in the world. The person who had to select the winner was none other than Thomas Telford himself. He rejected all the proposals including Brunel's. At that point the committee asked Telford to produce a proposal of his own. Don't you just love transparency? Brunel gave up at this point, and as he wrote in his diary, he went off to smoke away his anger by touring the north of England. The most famous photo of him shows him with a large cigar in his mouth, and he was a heavy smoker. He never went anywhere without his large leather cigar case. Anyway, he was offered some small jobs, but nothing of consequence, and this was probably one of the lowest points of his career. One thing he did do, however, was to take his first train journey on the newly built Liverpool to Manchester Railway. This would become pivotal later. Meanwhile, back in Bristol, Telford had produced a design for a bridge that included enormous Gothic towers rising from the bottom of the gorge. The committee rejected this proposal and opened another competition in 1831. Brunel entered a new project and in March of that year was declared the winner. Without going into too much detail, it could be said that he had managed to reduce the span to 630 feet by building one, sorry, by building two enormous towers. There would be one span across the gorge. The foundation stones were laid on the 27th of August, 1831, and then work stopped almost immediately as the city of Bristol was convulsed with rioting related to voting rights. This was a phenomenon in all the UK at the time. Brunel was by this time living in Bristol quite often and enrolled as a special constable. He even made an arrest. 12 people died and 80 were seriously injured in the rioting and there was extensive damage to the city. Confidence in Bristol suffered and investment dried up. Due to various other problems related to funding, work did not recommence for another five years. 
He'd made a lot of contacts among the great and the good of Bristol, as the rich and influential were called, I think not with a little irony. These contacts would lead to work on the port, railway, ship designing. However, that's for other episodes. In 1836, work on the bridge started again. The first thing to do was to build the towers. He built two extraordinary towers supporting the span. He made the span as narrow as possible by building one of the towers in front of the cliff. His project included a lot of innovative features. For example, chains with 15 feet, that's about four and a half meter lengths. The foundations were not solid blocks of masonry, but a series of enormous vaults, almost the size of a cathedral. Brunel realized that hollow structures being flexible were stronger. He came up with a lot of ideas that nowadays we would probably need com computer modeling to achieve. For the transfer of materials from one side of the gorge to the other, an iron rod one inch in diameter and a thousand feet long was made. It was positioned spanning the gorge and a traveling basket was hung underneath it and pulled along by ropes. One day it got stuck and was freed with great difficulty. Isambard insisted on traveling on the basket on the next run. As he had predicted, the basket got stuck again. He climbed out of the basket and onto the rod, hanging 200 feet above a ship passing below. But he fixed the problem. This was an extremely dangerous thing to do. If you have seen the episode on the Thames Tunnel, you'll know that he was a brave man. It has been suggested that he knew that his action would be witnessed by hundreds of people and was a form of self-advertising. I think he was a driven man and prepared to risk his life to achieve what he wanted. However, the publicity didn't hurt and Brunel was never slow at grabbing any free publicity. He called this basket the suspended traveller and he decided to let thrill seekers ride on it. They paid a shilling for the privilege. It was also an opportunity to raise extra funds. This was not to be the only time the bridge was used for thrills. On the 1st of April 1979, the first modern bungee jumps were made on that bridge. David Kirk and Simon Keeling of the Oxford University Dangerous Sports Club um, did a jump there. Given the date, many people, including myself, who saw the story on the news that day, thought it was an April Fool's prank. But it was true. The students had come up with the idea after discussing the vine jumping ritual in Vanuatu in the Pacific. The jumpers were arrested immediately afterwards, but the publicity started a worldwide craze. In 1845, the bridge company went bankrupt and work stopped. Again. A massive frustration. He had referred to the bridge project as my first child, my darling. He never saw this child grow up and moved on to other projects. In 1851, the committee received a proposal to complete the bridge from the American engineer Edward W. Serrell, who had just built a suspension bridge using wire cables over the Niagara River at Lewiston. But in January 1853, there was another setback. The Act of Parliament allowing the construction of the bridge expired. The suspension chains were sold to be used on Brunel's Royal Albert Bridge at Saltash. The iron bar used for the suspended traveller was sold for scrap and the land in Clifton returned to the Society of Merchant Venturers. On the 15th of September 1859, Brunel died at his home in Duke Street, Westminster after suffering a stroke. He was 53 years old. The engineers, John Hawkshaw and William Henry Barlow, met with a proposal to finish the bridge as a fitting memorial to Brunel. Hawkshaw was then working in London, replacing Brunel's Hungerford Bridge with a new railway bridge for Charing Cross Station. He realised that the Hungerford chains could be reused to complete the bridge at Clifton. 
parliamentary approval was gained and work started in 1862. On the 8th of December 1864, five years after Brunel's death, the bridge was finally opened. Despite heavy rain, 150,000 people filled the city streets to cheer processions of civic dignitaries. The procession met at Clifton Down at noon and after an official parade had crossed the bridge, it was formally declared open. So far, we've seen two projects that Isambard didn't finish or didn't see finished. Did he complete anything? Oh yes, lots of things. Among his achievements, he designed and oversaw the construction of over 100 bridges, 25 railways and three ships, but that's another story. He designed Box Tunnel for the Great Western Railway. This tunnel had all sorts of problems, including quicksand, and about 100 men died in its construction. Although Isambard built over 100 bridges, a lot of them are no longer with us. We need to remember that new railway companies only made money once the trains were running. One of Brunel's solutions was to build wooden bridges that were cheaper and quicker to erect. This meant that the railway could open sooner and start making money. The companies later replaced these bridges with iron or stone bridges. The last of Brunel's wooden bridges was demolished in 1934. It had been built in 1863. Not bad. But more about his other achievements in the next episode. Bye for now.